Welcome back, ghouls and goblins. I'm your host, Jason, and you're listening to the Esoteric Book Club. Tonight, we're going to delve into the mysteries of urban magic. After that, I have a brief review on an article that proposes replacing Confederate statues with those of the Mothman. Urban Magic, A Guide for the City Witch by Diana Rachel The best place to start is probably to answer the question, what exactly is urban magic? Urban magic is using the spirit of a city to power spells that benefit the city itself and or its inhabitants. To me, it personally sounds more like an animistic version of shamanism that takes place in an urban environment. The basis of urban magic is very similar to classical Greece and Rome, where individual cities had a patron deity that was personified by the city itself. A modern example would be New York City being personified in spirit by the Big Apple. The author goes on to explain what is exactly needed to create a city spirit. The first thing she proposes is that it has to have a mass transit system of some sort. Not only that, it has to have multiple options for mass transit. So you can't simply have a bus line. You have to have a bus line, a subway system, a train, taxi cabs, something along those lines. In addition to that, it has to also have a section of the city in which the buildings exceed 10 stories. The city's population also must exceed 100,000 individuals. Most importantly, the city's population must have a shared identity that is cohesive to everybody involved. For example, New Yorkers have a personality. Bostonians have one. Citizens of Portland have their own unique personality. A little closer to me, we have Pittsburgh. The point is that the citizens have to have this unique, cohesive, cultural identity that is tied to the city itself. These are not hard and fast rules, because obviously ancient Rome didn't have buildings exceeding 10 stories, and it didn't necessarily have a large transit system of any sort. The primary trait seems to be a shared cultural identity by the citizens of the city. Now, what is a city spirit? First of all, a city spirit is not a genius Loki or a spirit of the land. The city spirit can actually live alongside a genius Loki because cities are built on top of the land itself. It's an independent entity that is personified of the building and culture of the people that inhabit it. Think of a city spirit as an avatar or a patron to the area. Now, city spirits are not anti-nature. They exist in nature. But an urban magic worker can help minimize the damage that a city would cause to the surrounding land. Now that we've defined what a city spirit is, we have to look at what types of individuals could use this city spirit to power their magical practices. The author divides these workers into four different paths. The first is the civic path, then the chaos path, the hearth and home path, and finally the priesthood path. Workers in the civic path will deal directly with people and the concerns related to the citizenry of the city itself. Workers in the Chaos Path tend to do solo work and have their own individual goals and agendas. For that reason, the author really doesn't go into any specifics in this book for those who would work with the Chaos Path. That said, all the techniques in the book would still be applicable to those who want to work alone. The Hearth and Home Path is pretty much exactly what you would expect. It is a magical spell work practice that is focused on your own protection, your homestead, or the community at large in your immediate vicinity. The priesthood path is pretty much what we would expect from the classical world. These are individuals whose cares are for the city itself and the spirits that reside within. With these four definitions, I'm sure it's very easy to figure out which group you would fall into. Once you've decided that, the question becomes, what do you really need to know about working with urban magic? 
To understand urban magic, you have to first know the five laws. There's a little asterisk beside this too, because the author has added a sixth law of her own. The five laws are the law of microcosm and macrocosm, the law of sympathy, the law of the five elements, the law of authentic thaumaturgy, and the law of the collective unconscious. To better understand the law of microcosm and macrocosm, I look to my favorite movie, Jurassic Park. The shorthand is the, the butterfly effect. A butterfly can flap its wings in Peking, and in Central Park you get rain instead of sunshine. The idea is that small actions can have cascading effects on a larger scale. Another analogy that people may be a bit more familiar with is the idea of throwing a pebble into the surface of a lake. The pebble is small, but the ripples it creates spread out throughout the entire surface and eventually reach the shoreline. The energy imparted by that tiny pebble has now affected the entirety of the lake. These are the principles of the law of microcosm and macrocosm. Your tiniest action will have an effect that reaches the entire length and breadth of the city. Next, to understand the law of sympathy, we have to first look at science. Cohesion is a scientific term where one material bonds better with a like material. Water, for example. Drops of water will bond with other water molecules. The law of sympathy is very similar to this, only it's one step removed. Objects with like properties can influence one another without being directly involved. For example, if you were trying to affect an oak tree, you could use some of the acorns that fell from that oak. If you're attempting to influence an entire forest, you could use a gathering of acorns from various trees within that same forest. Furthermore, you can use objects to stand in for elemental properties. For example, a charcoal briquette to stand in for fire, or a feather to stand in for the element of air. That leads us directly into the next law, the law of the five elements. This principle is based on the Renaissance-era publication Three Books of Occult Philosophy by Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. In this, he proposes that there are four elements, earth, fire, air, water, in addition to spirit or ether. Everything in nature is made up of one or a combination of these elements based on the complexity of the object in question. Here's where things get a little tricky. An urban magic practitioner is going to have to be adaptable because different cultures have a different set of elements that they utilize in their practice. The five elements is very much a Western philosophical idea. In Asia, they include the elements wood and metal. Some Celtic practices incorporate the elements of land, sea, and sky. The idea is that you will have to adjust your own principles to meet those of the culture of the city and its citizens. Next is the law of authentic thaumaturgy. Now, most people are probably questioning, what exactly is thaumaturgy? When it comes down to it, thaumaturgy is just a big word meaning, well, magic. There's a few things involved in the practice of thaumaturgy. The first is the idea that if it works, it works. Why question it? Second is that there are names to things. In fact, there are true names that really identify the essence of what you are working with or targeting. To know these names is to have power over that object. Finally, is a concept that is very key to working with city spirits. If you're going to act as if something is alive, you'd better treat it as if it were a living entity. You wouldn't cover your dog in trash, or mark it up with graffiti. So why would you do that to the city whose spirit you are attempting to work with? Finally, we have the law of collective unconsciousness. Essentially, groups with a shared collective culture have a spirit of their own, 
this spirit will shift and change over time. When the culture shifts, so too does the city spirit. Now it's time for that little bonus law that I mentioned earlier. This is a law and a principle that really applies to any magical working, and that is the law that magic doesn't multitask, also known as the law of diminishing returns. The idea is that if you want a single spell to do multiple things, the power of that spell will be divided by the number of tasks that it is being told to do. If there are multiple outcomes that you're hoping to achieve, it's better to do a working for each individual outcome rather than trying to get it all done at once. Now that we know what urban magic actually is, what the principles behind it are, and the types of people who practice urban magic, what exactly do you do with it? Spells for urban magic vary as much as really any spells, but there are specific ones that have an emphasis on life in an urban environment. For example, a spell to prevent eviction, something to bring neighborhood unity, something to protect people against city predators, whether animal or human, or even just a simple spell to prevent someone from following you. All of these spells are going to need a power source, and in a city, you have no shortage of power. You just need to know where to look. We've already talked about the spirit of the city itself, but ultimately, that would be like trying to charge your cell phone by plugging it directly into a nuclear power plant. It's probably a little overkill. Instead, perhaps look to more localized spirits. Things like urban animal spirits, spirits attached to iconic buildings and structures, or use the mass transit system to power a spell. That's right, use the power invested in mass transit. I know you're already asking yourself, how exactly do I use that to power a spell? Well, the idea is that mass transit has a lot of kinetic energy pushed behind it. Mass transit is also the bloodstream and the lifeline of the city itself. So when you tap into a source, you're really tapping the vein of the city spirit. More interestingly, you can use the route that the transport takes to enact several different actions. For example, a subway train may go under a river, and flowing water disrupts magical energy. So if you have an entity that seems to have attached itself to you or an object you're carrying, Following the path that leads you under flowing water will help to dissipate it. Another example is there are magical principles that will ask you to walk Wittershins, or clockwise, around an area three times to activate it. If you're trying to affect a large portion of the city, walking around that three times in consecutive motion would be very tiring and possibly impossible. Instead, if you jump on mass transit, such as a bus, that has a set route that moves in a clockwise motion, you can perform the actual spell while being seated on the bus. Follow the route three times, and then disembark, and the spell is ready to go. Another unique aspect of a city is that it has a lot of roads. And where you have roads, you have crossroads. Most people think of crossroads in terms of Southern Conjure, where you would summon the devil at midnight and make a deal for your soul. But really, crossroad magic is much, much older and follows various principles. For example, in ancient Greece, a crossroads wasn't necessarily where two roads met. A crossroad could be any area where a road crosses in front of a doorway. According to some Celtic beliefs, even the beach could be considered a crossroads because it's an area between the ocean and the land. Ultimately, crossroads seem to be an area where two modes of travel or directions of travel diverge, and cities have no shortage of these areas. 
one such area just occurred to me at the time of this recording. Think of the stairwell that leads you from the sidewalk down to the subway. That could be considered a crossroads. Another unique source of magical energy is the railway system, because where you have trains, you have a ton of iron. Trains also often run against other traffic patterns, cross water, and follow a set route based on its rails. While it may not always be convenient, railways offer a lot of potential for banishing spells. Finally, another source of energy for urban magic is the ferry system. Many cities are based on a river system, so to get from one shore to the other, bridges aren't always available. In cases such as this, the ferry system comes to the forefront. In fact, a ferry combines a lot of aspects that are very useful for magical practitioners. You load a ferry on a crossroads. You disembark from a ferry on a crossroads. The travel itself crosses running water. And while you're on the ferry, you can actually gather sea foam or mist and get a unique combination of the elements of water and air. As you can see, urban environments offer practitioners a lot of opportunities for those who are adaptable. The greatest wisdom imparted by this book is the ability to find magic in an area that we otherwise would consider to be quite sterile. If any of this intrigues you, grab yourself a copy of Urban Magic by Diana Rachel at your local bookstore, or you could follow the affiliate link posted below. Next, we move on to something equally civic-minded. By this time, most people have become aware of the West Virginia cryptid known as the Mothman. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, the Mothman is a paranormal entity that gained notoriety in 1966 when it was first reported in the town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Following the collapse of the Silver Bridge, which linked Point Pleasant with Gallipolis, Ohio, this winged humanoid was viewed as a harbinger of tragedy. While few people believe Mothman was directly involved in the disaster, he is often seen as an omen of change. After the Silver Bridge fell in December of 1967, the U.S. government enacted the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1968, which included the nation's first requirements for bridge inspections. Oftentimes, the greatest change is precipitated by great upheaval. Riding the air currents driven before this cultural shift is the Mothman. Recently in our nation, we've reached another tipping point driven by racial discrimination and increasing militarization of the police. One of the demands of the activists is the removal of statues commemorating Confederate generals. These statues, most of which were erected in opposition to equal rights legislation, stand as monuments to a way of life that relied heavily upon slave labor to subsist. In West Virginia, a state that seceded from its Confederate parentage on June 20, 1863, there is a movement to remove a statue of Stonewall Jackson from the front of the Harrison County Courthouse. This statue was erected in 1953 by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. For the sake of plausible deniability, Thomas Stonewall Jackson was born in Clarksburg in 1824 when the state was still part of Virginia. That said, you must also consider who commissioned the statue and the timing of when it was erected. In this instance, plausible deniability won out over civil rights, and the overtly racist reminder of the state's checkered past remains in place to this day. What does this have to do with the Mothman, though? In 2018, video game producer Bethesda Game Studios released Fallout 76, a post-apocalyptic survival adventure game. This installment was set entirely within the state of West Virginia. It relies heavily on local folklore for its antagonists. One particular antagonist was the Mothman. While the game was met with widely varying opinions, it did help cement the Mothman as an unofficial state mascot. On June 12, 2020, a petition began to circulate on Change.org, demanding that Stonewall Jackson's statue and all Confederate monuments in West Virginia be replaced with statues of the Mothman. 
At the time of this recording, there are over a dozen petitions, and the primary one has close to a thousand signatures. While the petition doesn't demonstrate overwhelming support for this idea, the concept has won both national and international attention. It has even spilled beyond the borders of West Virginia. Some people are proposing that all Confederate statues should be replaced with the Mothman. Symbolically, this represents the collapse of a subtly racist system of intimidation and oppression. The Mothman would, once again, reveal himself as an omen of change, this time toppling an ideal rather than a physical structure. Jay Sisson, a West Virginia schoolteacher, said in an interview with Mel Magazine, I want our community to beat the odds, and the Mothman can embody that spirit because it's ours. It's a symbol for something bigger. I agree with Jay, and I think that's exactly why I don't want the Mothman to replace every Confederate statue. Because it's ours. Specifically, it is so iconic to Point Pleasant. While Mothman is now synonymous with West Virginia, let him remain with his home. Harrison County has options for replacements. For example, retired ESPN sportscaster Mike Patrick. West Virginia Secretary of State and WVU's first female Mountaineer mascot, Natalie Tennant. Perhaps even something commemorating the Hopewell people who built the nearby Oak Mounds, a pair of pre-Columbian burial mounds dated to around the year 100 BC. My point is this. Removal of Confederate statues is well overdue. West Virginia left the Confederacy. It's hard to argue that these statues are anything but a racist intimidation tactic. What we replace them with is equally important. A meme, no matter how beloved it may currently be, is not necessarily the best option. Let's find something culturally significant, something inclusive, that future generations can look upon with pride. Let's do better. Let's be better. More importantly, Let's learn from our mistakes. I'm sure you noticed at the beginning of the podcast, I had new introduction music. I want to give a special shout out to Sarah Rudy and her band Hello June, who graciously allowed me to use her song Fight Don't Fight as introduction music for my podcast. As a special reward to everybody listening, I get to play Fight Don't Fight in its entirety for you to close out the show. If you want to find more information out about Hello June, check out the links below. Until next time, enjoy the song, and remember, stay weird.